Recording 11. A letter. I've been having a weird time since I started recording these letters. I've been finding them exciting, but it's beginning to make sleeping soundly impossible. However, this letter, as frightening as it is, has made me feel slightly better, if only because I am somehow comforted by Samuel receiving odd mail also. Dear Lisa, I'm hoping this letter finds its way to you as it is of great importance to me that someone hears about the recent predicament I find myself in. I debated whether or not it was worth it or even safe to tell another soul, but it's been eaten away at my remaining sanity and ever since Molly's passing, writing things out has helped me cope. Usually I keep what I write myself, but this time it's different, as you will soon see. Funnily enough, my story began with me receiving a letter of my own about a week ago now. I was preparing the showpiece floral arrangement for my first wedding booking in months when I heard the clanging of my local postman Sammy's cart approach my store. The man had quite frankly always given me the creeps and if I didn't fear the possibility of retaliation on his part I would have my post delivered to a P.O. box. Not in the mood on this particular day, due to the stress of the work ahead of me that day, I decided to forego any attempt at pleasantries with him. I tossed the small handful of letters on a nearby table and went to continue my arrangement. But the normally brisk Sammy had decided to linger on and stare at me. Is there anything else? I questioned. Aren't you going to read them? He grunted, pointing at the letters. Just my luck, the one day I decide to not even try with him, he starts taking an interest in me. I'll get around to them later, I answered, continuing my work. He seemed dissatisfied, though, eventually, with a reluctant sigh, he left me alone. The sounds of his carts ominously echoing down the deserted weekday high street. Later that day, once I'd finally did get around to opening them, I came to find a manila envelope with a wax seal amongst the mountains of bills. Obviously, I was very intrigued, as it isn't every day one receives such a fine-looking piece of post. Even more intriguing, though, was the fact that the front simply read, Sam, in swirly calligraphy. I took a quick glance around before unceremoniously ripping open the letter. A sheet of paper and a Polaroid photo dropped out onto the floor. My heart, at this point, was beating harder than it ever had before as I knelt down and retrieved the falling contents of the letter. Taking a look at the Polaroid, I nearly fainted. It was a picture of Molly. Outside the storefront and in the window, a floral arrangement read out, Join me. Turning over the letter, I read it out aloud. My dearest Sam, I request your presence at the place that I rest, as without you, the place I exist, I truly do detest. Lovingly yours, Molly. Not often do I react with tears. In fact, even at Molly's funeral itself, I only shed a solitary tear as she was lowered down into the earth. At that point, though, tears of years of my silent anguish all rolled out at once. Eventually, I composed myself, and tucking the Polaroid in my pocket, I sprinted through the town until I arrived at the graveyard. I'm not proud of the fact, but until that point, I had not visited her grave since the funeral, so after an arduous search of row after row, in the general region I knew it had been, I found her tombstone. Atop it sat fresh roses inside of a plain vase, I stood there motionless, staring for hours and hours until the dark started to take over from the daylight. After those hours of deliberation and reflection, I came to the only logical conclusion I could. Someone was trying to play a cruel trick on me. I thought that it had to be that. Alas, what happened next was not logical. Nor before it happened did I believe it to be possible. As I turned to leave Molly's grave, the familiar rattle of a postal cart filled the air. Time seemed to legitimately stop. The grass once blowing in the wind froze. Birds 
flying above took a still position in the skyline, and my own body took on a sick imitation of rigor mortis. After what felt like the passing of days, the world snapped back into time and a force barreled into my back, sending me crashing onto Molly's grave. My head smashed into the vase and a trickle of blood started to run down my forehead as I turned to face my attacker. Standing there, in a form not quite human, but not quite ghostly, was Molly. We stared at each other, my mouth aghast at the sight before my eyes. She mouthed the same words her Polaroid has instructed. Join me. Fight or flight is what they say, right? Well, I wholeheartedly chose flight. With pace I had never been gifted, I dashed all the way to my apartment, locking the doors and retreating to the safety of my bed. I regret this as I replay everything over and over in my mind. As I have done the last seven days, I've been holed up in here. In fact, the first time leaving the apartment since will be when I post this letter to you, Lisa. Was it really my wife? Or has this all occurred within the confines of my mind? I lean towards the former. Also, is Sammy involved in all this? And if so, why? These are a mere drop in the ocean of questions I have. But I find myself with no more paper to relay such a wealth of pondering to you. Really, I'm not sure if I want advice from you, Lisa, or to answer any of my questions. I think it just helps me to know that someone knows the impossible occurrences that I've experienced. Do, however, feel free to respond with your thoughts, if you do wish to. I hope I'm here to reply if you do choose. Regards, Samuel. Well, I'm sorry that this has happened to Samuel. I know how hard it can be to lose someone. But to have them come back, not only come back, but assault you. Well, it's at the very least unnerving. I wish I could respond, as I've said before, but there was nothing about this one that would have given me a clue. However, there was a single small petal lodged in the bottom of the envelope. I recognise it but I can't remember what flower it's from. That was Recording 11, a letter, written by Thomas Cronin, read by Caroline Laurie.